Bassett did a very good job of covering, but I do want to cover a few points. Uh, the first point <coughs> is going back to 3106A, Public Resources Code 3106A, uh, which describes what the supervisor's obligations are. He is to supervise the drilling operation, maintenance, and abandonment of wells uh, in order to facilitate production and also so as far as possible to prevent damage to life, health, property, natural resources, damage to underground oil, or loss of oil or gas or reservoir energy. That section, the portion about uh, protecting life, health, and property, if you look at the Attorney General's opinion at page 470, was added in about 1970 and constituted a, an expansion of the division's role as the supervisor of oil and gas operations. Prior to that, the Division of Oil and Gas had been fundamentally focused on conservation and production. And in 1970, the legislature started to expand its role into other areas of oil and gas production, specifically making sure that it was done safely. There are two focuses of what the recovery methods approved by the DOG can do. One of them is increasing the ultimate recovery of hydrocarbons by using methods that are in the opinion of the supervisor, that's the supervisor of the Division of Oil and Gas, suitable for the purpose in each proposed case. So the determination of which methods of production are suitable is delegated to the supervisor of the Division of Oil and Gas. And then, in order to further the elimination of waste, and we'll address waste in a minute, uh, by increasing the recovery of underground hydrocarbons, it is declared, as Mr. Boutra said, a policy of the state that a grant in an oil and gas lease, unless otherwise agreed between the lessor and the lessee, gives the lessee the right to use any method that appears suitable and that is approved by the supervisor, in order, including the injection of air, gas, water, or other fluids into the subsurface in order to enhance production. The um, Division of Oil and Gas has some very specific requirements for its people. The supervisor must appoint a chief deputy and at least one district deputy for each of the six districts. The chief deputy must be a competent engineer or geologist registered in California and experienced in the development and production of oil and gas. Each district deputy also has to be a competent engineer or geologist preferably registered in California. Through this, the director uh, encourages the wise development of oil and gas resources in a manner to best meet the oil and gas needs of this state. That's the entire state, not a particular county, not a particular city. It is the entire state. California is also signatory to the Interstate Compact to Conserve Oil and Gas which a number of other states are signatory to. One of the things that California agrees to do as part of that is to prevent the drilling, equipping, spacing, or operating of a well or wells so as to bring up physical waste of oil, gas, or loss of in the ultimate recovery. And if you go back to 3106, that prevention of waste language appears in 3106. The 1976 Attorney General's opinion was written 41 years ago. Things have changed in 41 years. In that opinion, the Attorney General recognized that the DOG's role was expanding. That again is at page 470. In 1981, five years later, the state applied on behalf of the Division of Oil and Gas for Primacy 
in implementing the provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act pertaining to underground injection. In 1982, the division was granted primacy by the US EPA for administering the underground injection provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act. In 2013, California expanded the DOG's role again by adopting SB4 and directing the DOG to implement new regulations covering well stimulation treatments, which include acid stimulation and hydraulic fracturing. And in 2015, California adopted some additional statutes that required the division to consult with the State Water Board, another agency whose members have to have specific qualifications. Um, I believe that's Water Code Section 175. And uh, regrettably, one of them is to be a water lawyer, and the other four are to be engineers. The DOG has adopted and implemented detailed regulations covering well stimulation treatments. Those appear in California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Section 1780 to 1789. Those are exhaustive. They contain a detailed list of every piece of information that must be provided to the supervisor along with an application of, to do a well stimulation treatment. The DOG has also adopted and implemented detailed regulations addressing wastewater disposal. And Section 1775 of the Code of Regulations requires that oil field waste, including water, be disposed of in such a manner as to not cause damage to life, health, property, freshwater aquifers or natural resources, which goes back to 3106, which is what the DOG is, supervisor is told to do. There have been specific regulations implemented regarding what uh, the requirements for an injection there are, and those appear at 1748 to 1748.3 and 1779.1. With all of that, Looking at Measure Z and its various provisions, it is clearly preempted by state and federal law. Mr. Boutros went through these, uh, the aspects of limitations on the initiative process in detail. I'm not going to dwell on them, but the bottom line is important. Uh, initiatives obviously uh, can be enacted, but they're subject to the same restrictions as legislation adopted by the legislature. And initiatives that conflict with existing state law whether by duplicating, contradicting, or entering an area fully occupied by general law or void. Local ordinance contradicts state law where the ordinance is inimical to or cannot be rec reconciled with state law. And a local ordinance enters a field that's fully occupied when the legislature has either expressly manifested its intent to occupy the area or impliedly done so. Implied occupation takes place when the subject matter is so fully and completely covered by general law as to clearly indicate that it is exclusively a matter of state concern. That occurs in the case of SB4. SB4 is a comprehensive regulation that covers all aspects of well stimulation treatments. The subject matter is also partially, can also be impliedly occupied when it's partially covered by general law, couched in terms as to indicate clearly that a paramount state concern will not tolerate further other local action. LU-121, which is the well stimulation treatment ban, uh, bans the development, construction, installation, or use of surface facilities in support of well stimulation treatments. LU-121 defines well stimulation treatments identically to Public Resources Code Section 3157, which is part of SB4, indicating that the intent of LU-121 is to cover exactly the same topic in a slightly different way by dealing with surface installations, but clearly focused on the underground effect. Because the same surface installations presumably could be used for other things, it's only where they're used for well stimulation of treatments that they are banned by LU-121. Measure Z uh, contains language banning well stimulation treatment, while SB4 recognized that well stimulation treatments, including hydraulic fracturing, were critical to boosting oil and gas production, which is a announced policy of this state that is implemented through the Division of Oil and Gas. Where LU-121 bans 
well stimulation treatments, or at least surface uses in support of them. SB4 directs the Division of Oil and Gas to adopt rules and regulations specific to well stimulation treatments, thereby <coughs> promoting them. So on the one hand, one well bans them. The state law, however, encourages but wants to regulate them. SB4 also added sections to the Public Resources Code that required an independent study and preparation of those extensive regulations. LU-122, which is the wastewater disposal ban, again bans surface uses, but only those surface uses that are focused on specific underground activities. Therefore, it is focused on the underground activities and is impliedly regulating them. This section was dealt with before. It's section 300H of Title 42. It is the section that says that in creating regulations under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the administrator may not prescribe requirements that interfere with or impede underground injection of produced water. That indicates that there is a, uh, a desire to allow that activity to continue unless it's essential to, to assure that underground sources of drinking water will not be endangered. So the, the, the import of the section is that oil and gas companies will be able to continue to dispose of their produced water the way they always have been, unless there is a determination that they have to stop with respect to a specific formation because someone has made a determination that it's essential to assure that underground sources are protected. The agencies that are assigned the task of making that essential determination are the DOG and the State Water Board. The EPA uh, entered into a primacy agreement with the DOG that says that the DOG has primary responsibility for making those recommendations, and then the state legislature added that the State Water Board uh, must interact with the DOG and they have to concur in making a recommendation to the EPA with respect to each uh, aquifer exemption application. So it's their job to determine whether or not a, a ban on oil and gas injection into a particular formation is essential to assure that underground sources of drinking water will not be endangered. LU-122's outright ban on underground injection turns that upside down. By doing so, uh, LU-122 effectively says that we're going to assume the role of the Division of Oil and Gas and the State Water Board, and we've made a determination without going through all of the processes that the Division of Oil and Gas, the EPA, and the State Water Board implemented to make that determination, that uh, a complete ban is necessary to prevent unnecessary interference with disposal or unnecessary uh, is necessary to protect uh, aquifers. That's a task that was assigned to the division. The exception procedure contemplated by section six also works backwards because it requires, rather than a showing that uh, a prohibition on injection is essential to protect drinking water, there's a presumption that there is going to be no injection and the companies have to come in and go through a, a, a showing showing that they, they should be allowed to do it for constitutional reasons. That's not what was contemplated by the EPA, not what was contemplated by the Congress, not what was contemplated by the legislature. The new well ban likewise prohibits the drilling of any wells within the unincorporated area of the county. The plain language of LU 123 doesn't allow the drilling of replacement wells or any additional drilling activities. It's very clear, it said no new wells. In addition, it states that its objective is to prevent expansion of oil and gas production operations and prevention of the use of the equipment used to drill them. That purpose would not be served by allowing the sidetracking, horizontal drilling, or other activities that the county and the interveners claim is allowed. Under the uh, Interstate Compact, that violates uh, California's obligation not to engage in activities that bring about a loss in the ultimate recovery of oil and gas, because as explained by uh, Chevron, it's necessary to continue drilling wells 
both for purposes of steam injection and for purposes of extraction of oil and for purposes of extracting water in order for Chevron to continue to uh, effectively operate San Arte. Similarly, my client Eagle has a partially completed uh, steam flood project that is a miniature version of the San Arto project. It requires additional steam injection wells and it requires additional production wells in order to reach areas of the oil field that cannot be reached with the existing wells. We're dealing with very heavy oil. The heavy oil does not move easily through the subsurface formation. It requires multiple points of exit from the formation and it requires heat being applied uniformly in a manner that is designed by engineers who have expertise in these things. Uh, and the Division of Oil and Gas Supervisor in dealing with heavy oil has the authority to approve proposals to drill wells at whatever locations he deems advisable in order to ensure the proper development of those hydrocarbons by the application of heat. That ends my comments. Eagle otherwise concurs and joins in the arguments made by the other petitioners. Your Honor, I'll make this extraordinarily brief. This is David Balch on behalf of the TRIO plaintiffs. Uh, and we join in uh, the arguments made by other counsel so far. Uh, I just noted an interesting point in the, in the administrative record that was produced by the County of Monterey. And it's on page 19. There was a hearing on the fifth, uh, in 2015 on March 17th. And someone from the Resource Management Agency was discussing the division between the County of Monterey and Dogger when it comes to permitting. And of course, we've heard a little bit about the land use issues that interveners in the county have raised. Well, this person from Resource Management told the Board of Supervisors, uh, through the permit process, the county, quote, looks at surface impacts to the surrounding land uses that would become during oil and gas extraction. We look at biological resources, impacts to cultural resources, aesthetics, and traffic impacts. Those are the type of impacts the county was looking at. And then they said, and, it, and if we determine to issue a use permit, uh, looking at those factors, we then turn it over to the state. The Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal is the responsible state agency for the permitting of drilling wells, operation of wells, the maintenance, the plugging, the abandonment of wells. The county's all the staffer said, Dogger is responsible for the underground injection program through a delegation from EPA. Uh, and this is part of the administrative record put in by uh, by the county. Later in that same hearing, Supervisor Salinas said people have come up to him saying ban fracking, and his response is go ahead and do it statewide, get an election, but going county to county doesn't make sense. And then he says it's, we, we are preempted. Uh, this is all in the record, and again, it's, it's history, but I do believe this history shows exactly where the county understood the delineation lines to be for permitting pr purposes. And they, the county has historically looked at traffic impacts, uh, is chaparral being uh, taken, things like that, Your Honor. Um, the arguments now that land use, their land use jurisdiction somehow extends beyond that really are, are new arguments created for the purpose of this hearing. And again, Your Honor, we join in everything else uh, that has been said so far. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, Good afternoon. Edward Rudd, Wilson appearing for uh, Nero, California, and 80-some-odd uh, mineral and royalty owners in South County. Uh, I will be very brief. Well, by the way, <coughs> that is the case ending in 0871. Uh, I do have on your desk a black little black folder, thank you, Your Honor. I don't have any slides. Yeah, that's it. It's thin, so you can see we're going to get through that quickly. <laughs> I want to just raise one point, and it's a constitutional issue, but it's not a federal constitutional issue. It's a state constitutional issue. And it's the impact of Article 11, 
Section 7 of the California Constitution. And if you flip to tab number one on that little uh, booklet that I gave you, you will see uh, that uh, California Constitution Article 11, Section 7 says, quote, a county or city may make and enforce within its limits all local, police, sanitary, and other ordinances and regulations not in conflict with general laws. And I'm keying on not in conflict with general laws, Your Honor. If you turn to tab two, you will see uh, section 3106 of the public relations, the public resources code. And if, you and if you look down at 3106B, I've uh, taken the liberty of highlighting in yellow what I think is the key language. It says, the supervisor shall also supervise the drilling, operation, maintenance, and abandonment of wells so as to permit the owners or operators of the wells to utilize all methods and practices known to the oil industry for the purpose of increasing the ultimate recovery of underground hydrocarbons and which in the opinion of the supervisor are suitable for this purpose uh, in each proposed case. And the point very simply, let me just start with the well, you, Measure Z has three land use uh, permit uh, or three land use pro prohibitions. First of all, LU 1.21. Uh, deals with uh, well stimulation treatments, which are defined to be anything that increases the permeability of oil and gas bearing formations. Uh, the uh, supervisor issues permits for well stimulation treatments, as we've heard of it, heard at great length this morning and this afternoon. The the supervisor, when he issues the permit gives, purports to give the operator the right to use that technique, but LU 1.21 says you can't. That is a direct conflict which violates Article 11, Section 7. No way around that. LU 1.22 uh, prohibits the use of any well to inject wastewater into the ground for purposes of disposal or storage. Under 3106B, the supervisor issues permits. That purports to give operators the right to inject wastewater into the ground for the purpose of uh, disposal or storage. So the supervisor gives, says you have a right to do this issues you a permit so that you may do it. LU-122 says you may not do it. That is a direct conflict. No way around it that I can see. Uh, 123 uh, prohibits drilling any new well, wells for purposes of exploring for oil or aiding in the recovery of oil. Now, that too uh, comes under uh, 3106B because, as you have heard, once the county issues its land use permit, which in this county is a conditional use permit with conditions, the, um, uh, once that permit has been issued, then the supervisor issues is free to issue permits uh, for the drilling of wells, because uh, the number of wells, where you drill them, where they're bottomed, what they're used for, all falls within the purview of the supervisor. Uh, so the supervisor says you can drill a well uh, in pursuance of your, say, your uh, wastewater disposal program or your steam flood program. LU 1.23 says you may not. That is a direct conflict, no way around it. Um, to uh, make it clear that once the uh, conditional use permit is granted, the uh, supervisor 
of oil and gas takes over. Let me refer you to the material under tab three, which is a conditional use permit that was issued in 1980 uh, to, I believe, Mobile Oil Corporation. I think that's now operated by, uh, uh, by ERA. But you will see that it is a permit for, quote, drilling and exploring for oil and gas located in, and then there's a, a series of, there's a legal description, it's a series of section 35 downship 22 south, etc. And so once that issues, and by the way, it's listed, it's got a number of conditions on it. One of the, just below it you can see, the conditions among them are, uh, uh, well, you can't cut down oak trees to make room for uh, well sites. Uh, I'm sure if it were issued today, there'd be a lot more conditions. They, they put conditions on it, and, and, and at that point, they've exhausted their, uh, the, the county has, under its scheme, has exhausted its land use uh, controls over uh, that particular part of the oil field. Uh, that isn't to say that they can't come back later and deal with fencing requirements and sound and all that sort of thing, but as far as land use, that is zoning, where things are going to be located. They've, they've done their job when they issued the when they issued the conditional use permit. And there's something very interesting about this particular permit that is worth looking at. And that is, if you will turn to the very last page uh, under tab three, you'll see a letter dated May 17, 2007 under this same uh, conditional use permit, which is, I think, 40-something, it's uh, conditional use permit ZA 4010. And under 4010, there was apparently a letter preceding this that, that uh, asked a question of the, uh, uh, or from uh, ERA, I believe, and the, the question was answered here by the uh, planning department, the issue is whether they need a conditional use permit, they error, uh, having received or succeeded to this conditional use permit, do they need a new conditional use permit in order to install steam generators on the surface of the land? And the letter says, no, you don't. We've determined that you don't. Uh, the, and why is that? Well, it's because the energy produced by the proposed steam generators and Codet generation unit will be used on site for the San Ardo unit of ERA Energy LLC. So that uh, the, uh, it's a clear indication, a clear admission by the county that no, once this, uh, this uh, conditional use permit is issued, allowing you to produce oil uh, from Section 35, etc., uh, uh, in the San Ardo field. Uh, the, uh, at that point, the permitting uh, of, of, of everything that is done thereafter uh, in connection with developing oil and gas, that's in the hands of the Division of Oil and Gas. So I say there's the, uh, the include not only that L, LU-121 and LU-122 are preempted by 3601, but also LU-123 is. Um, the final tab, tab four, uh, has the, uh, contains the regulations, uh, 14 California Code of Regulations, section 1724 at SEC. They are relevant because they make it clear that the, uh, these uh, uh, wastewater disposal projects, these uh, steam flood projects, and indeed uh, uh, water flood projects, whatever your project is that involves putting liquid in the ground, are all first must be permitted as, uh, as projects. And the, the it, 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 and when you apply for say a steam injection or a steam flood project, there's a and if you look at 1724.7, you see a long list of what's required 
And if you look at item subdivision five, uh, you've got to tell them the plan, the well bring it, drilling, and plugging and abandonment program to complete the project, including flood pattern map showing all injection, production, and flood and abandoned wells and unit boundaries. So once again, uh, you, uh, the, uh, we, we see that once the land use part of the package has been completed, and that's completed by the uh, uh, by the county, and they do the uh, the EIR part of it as well. Uh, once that's done, uh, the, uh, the 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 permit turns to the county, and or not the county turn, turns the daughter, and the uh, the county's job is complete. Did I make it short? I said I'd make it short. But I'm not quite sure I made it short enough. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Your Honor, may I hand a uh, copy of my PowerPoint together to provide you? Before I get started, That 
Your Honor, uh, this is the Associated Home Builders case. <coughs> and we've had discussion here about a burden of proof. Uh, that's not what we are talking about. We're talking about presumptions of interpretation. Because, as I just said, the courts have decided that the initiative and referendum um, as articulating one of the most precious rights of our democratic process. And then it goes on to say, and this is the Associated Home Builders case, uh, 118 Cal 3rd 582, and we gave the pinpoint site in the PowerPoint. <coughs> Quote, it has long been our judicial policy to apply a liberal construction to this power wherever it is challenged in order that the right be not improperly won. If doubts can reasonably re be resolved in favor of the use of this reserved power, courts will preserve it. That's the context that we're now going to use as we interpret Measure C. It is not um, a burden of proof that your court, the court is going to look at. So, Your Honor, um, let's go ahead and talk about the interpretation of each of the three land use provisions that we've been talking about here. And that first one is the prohibition on well stimulation treatment. Let's clear away things that we should not be disputing, and I don't think we are. The first is, it does not apply to steam flooding or cyclic steam. And it does not apply to routine maintenance or activities that do not affect the integrity of the formation. Your Honor, if you look at the definition of well stimulation treatment, it is quite clear that it includes cyclic steaming, which we've talked about, and it includes routine maintenance. This is section two of the definition of LU 1.221. Did you say it includes or excludes? Excludes. <laughs> <laughs> And let's also be clear, as Your Honor pointed out, that there is no fracking going on here. So, whereas here you have a specific reference in measures of these activities uh, that are allowed, uh, that would supersede general concerns about the ambiguity with respect to that situation. Now, let's turn to the second restriction, the, pro the prohibition on new wells. The, the language of Measure C does say no new wells. But, to, but as is important in every issue of statutory interpretation, the intent is very important. So, start with, this was the County Council's impartial analysis that was part of the legislative, the administrative record before Measure Z was put to the voters. And his interpretation is that new wells means no net new wells. Not that there could never be any wells, but there was no net new wells. And he backs it up by reference to the purpose of Measure Z. And so now, we're going to turn to the findings that Measure Z articulates. Finding three, and the highlighted portion points out that fracking has occurred in one instance in the past. And, excuse me if I misquoted, it has occurred in the past. 
and that the, the, the residents must act now to ensure their use does not expand. The key I'm focusing on, obviously, is the word expand. That's finding three. This, Your Honor, is finding five. Again, the focus of excuse me, finding six. And the focus here is that expanding oil and gas production operations and continuing to drill new oil and gas wells is incompatible. Then it drops down under finding number seven, expanding oil and gas production operations in modern economy is incompatible with their agricultural heritage and rural character. And finally, finding nine, expanding oil and gas production operations will further degrade our air quality. The focus on Measure Z was not to bring oil production to a halt, but rather to prevent its expansion. And that becomes pretty clear as we look at all of these findings. Argue 
that between injecting wastewater, which we say is not allowed, and injecting treated water for through the reverse osmosis process, there's a range of what you should consider under Measure Z. In other words, should certain types of water in the process be allowed to be considered treated and re-injected or not? And I think we started out early on, Your Honor, and you pointed out that Donovan's regulations supply <coughs> definitions of wastewater treatment. And I think counsel argued that it would be ironic if we use <coughs> the definitions from Donovan to save an ordinance that they argue is preemptive. Well, it's not really ironic. Because again, the test is how do you interpret Measure Z? And if Your Honor were to find that Measure Z should be interpreted as it relates to other types of water that's been, quote, treated, does or does not apply to that and, and tie it to Donovan's standards, that would be how you read Measure Z. And then you turn with that reading of Measure Z to see whether it's preemptive. In other words, the use of terms by Dogger does not necessarily mean that the, the step that Measure Z is preemptive. Rather, it tells you how it can be used to interpret Measure Z, and then from there see whether there is preemption. I also want to talk about storing water. Um, the Measure Z allows, prohibits the, the injection of produced water for storage or disposal. Um, the use of Measure Z, excuse me, the use of produced water for steam flooding, for cyclic steaming, we believe is not storing. First of all, um, their experts have said that 80% of that's recovered. But third of all, or second of all, if you look at the declaration of uh, Mr. Kemp that he attached to the report in Baker and Obama, on pages 49 and 52, he defines the three outputs of water that's been produced. He says that one, some of it's used for as treated water that's then put back into the ground. And he points to the, the water that is in the subject of reverse osmosis or the water that is treated so it can be reused to inject as steam. It's fair point. He, he carves out three categories. You're right. One is water that's been treated with reverse osmosis that you put back into the ground. And we've talked about that. And as I've tried to articulate, that is a lot. He also says some of it, produced water, is reinjected and disposed of or stored. And he, that's what, I'm not sure he used the word stored, but it creates a third category for the water that's reinjected to produce water. That's the water that's, that's um, subject to Measure Z. And then there's the middle category, the water that is produced water that is used for to, be, to recreate steam and put back into the ground. The point I'm trying to make is that plaintiff's experts, or expert, does not consider the water that's used for steam to be disposed of or stored because he says that that's a third category. The second category is what he talks about how it's reused in the industrial process. So what's going on is, and everybody understands this, some of the water is reused, but it's not reused to, to store or dispose, it's reused to create steam. And, and Your Honor was asking about storage. The water is underground, 
but it's not being stored there because a large portion of it comes back up. And all of it is part of the production processes because in response to questions you asked, that water is helping keep the temperature high, it's, deal, it's addressing pressure issues, it's replacing what's been taken out. And that process just continues to roll forward. And what's the difference between storage and disposal? I would assert, Your Honor, storage is when you put it in the ground with no intention of using it in your process. Because that steam is not being, let me put it another way. The steam that's being re-injected, they're not trying to keep it there. They're not trying to store it there. They're using it as part of an active, ongoing process. But then, if storage means you don't intend to reuse it, what is disposal? I think, <coughs> I think when you can store something let me put it a different way. If something is part of the production process that's active and circulating, I don't think that should be considered storage either. I understand your, your point is storage surplusage when compared to disposal. But I, I think that when you store something, you store it there and then you intend to remove it all. But this is part of an ongoing production process. Is in order. I, uh, it, it's been asserted that Measure Z allows or encourages the treatment of water through reverse osmosis. treat that water without storing it first. And then once you've done that and you use it by putting it back into wetlands or underground water supplies, is that not disposing of the water? Uh, Your Honor, uh, in San Arto, the, the when they take water out and use it for the, the Sorry, yeah. Measure C prohibits storage underground or in land use impoundments. Land use impoundments does not occur. When they treat water, produce water, it's part of a production cycle and it's in tanks and pipes. And through that, through those diagrams, some of which you saw, the water is, is routed to different parts of the production facility, but it's not stored in a way that Measure Z considers storage. Measure Z is only concerned about storage or disposal of water in land use impoundments on the ground. So to, to kind of wrap this up, if you've got a process which the water is re-injected underground, and 80% of that steam comes back through your production process, and then you're continuing to add steam and take it out, some of which keeps cycling. I don't think that's <coughs> I think it's using it for production. And so I can't tell you every use of storage and whether that can occur outside of disposal. It's beyond my limitations. But, I don't think when you're using it as part of production, uh, it, it's considered storage.
when it's done with that. that if, would you please repeat your question? Sure. Sir. Sir, they, basically three things happen. That's the one that comes out of the there's, there's a pre-existing reservoir of water in the area where these oil deposits are found. It's not added. Uh, production techniques extracted and make use of it. And some of it is treated in some way so that it can be used for steam injected injection and just place it back in there. Some of it is purified, for want of a better word, through the reverse osmosis process. And some of it is re-injected in its natural form back down into the ground. And that would either be stored or disposed. And I suppose, Your Honor, the distinction being that if it's left there and not intended to be brought back up at any point, Disposed. If it's brought back up in a later date, then it would be stored. But either way, if it's in that lower foundation, which is no longer part of the production process, it's one of the
there's a necessity as that chamber, the unoccupied portion of that chamber increases, or the chamber expands, that additional steam injection valves need to be drilled in order to keep that steam chest functional and keep the oil heated so that it can be extracted. How does segment three measure seeking the no new drilling prohibition allow that or preclude it? But there you might never be adding new ones, not replacing existing ones, but adding new ones to keep the steam chest Oh, uh, I see. When I was saying no net new wells, uh, that contemplates that you could drill a new well as part of the steam chest situation that you were describing. And if you, if you look at the evidence submitted by plaintiffs, um, one of the experts uh, talks about how many wells are drilled fresh and how many are abandoned. And, and so as long as you didn't increase the total number of wells that you had in operation, then you could put in your wells there Consistent with the, top, the idea that you don't expand operations overall. But is it what the experts are saying? Is that you have to increase the number of wells in order to keep to steam the oil uh, process? Yes. And, and, and we're saying, as county council has interpreted Metro Z, as long as those new wells that are being put in to assist in the, in the steam chest don't increase the total number of wells you have in operation after subtract after considering what's been abandoned, you can do that. And, and Your Honor, um, in the same way that sidetracking, which we understand is allowed to help augment the production of a well, this is part of the same, same concept. It's expanding overall operations, not prohibiting any new wells of any kind. Uh, on the issue of federal preemption, says that regulations of the administrator for state and ground injection control programs and I'm referring to 42 U.S. from 300H. Those regulations may not prescribe requirements which interfere with or impede the underground injection of brine or other fluids brought to the surface or any underground injection for the secondary or tertiary recovery of, oil, recovery of oil or natural gas, unless such requirements are essential to assure that underground sources of drinking water will not be endangered by such injection. And so the question is, in, in view of the evidence, which is the State Department of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources, in conjunction with the State Water Resources Control Board, under the blanket of authority given by the EPA pursuant to the State Drinking, the State Drinking Water Act, has made a determination that it's, that it's not necessary. And what they determine is perhaps not so important as the fact that they have made a determination the question is who's, who gets to make that call about whether it's necessary to assure that the underground sources of drinking water will not be in danger. <laughs> state that there is privacy to 
question is whether sources are in danger. However, as long as the county's local ordinance is not inconsistent with the goals of, as stated in the, in the statute that you cited, then it's permitted. And I can walk through the case law on, on the federal preemption if you'd like. Well, I, I'm just concerned. I mean, it, it seems as though prohibiting <coughs> underground steam injection disposal impairs or impedes the underground injection of brine or other fluids brought to the surface in connection with oil or natural gas production or any underground injection for the secondary or tertiary recovery of oil or natural gas. So, as far as preemption by that particular U.S. Code section is concerned, it seems to me the only leeway by way of exception to that would be if such requirements were essential to assure that underground sources of drinking water will not be endangered by such injection. And there's, there's been a determination by the state agencies, DOGGR and State Water Resources Control Board, on that topic. And whether the decision is right or wrong, it seems as though those agencies have been given the right to make that call uh, as a higher legislative body than a local governmental entity. I think, respectfully, um, that's not the focus of the, the donor nature. When an applicant comes in to re-inject wastewater for water or sewage disposal, they have to comply with regs. And they cannot endanger underground drinking water sources. And similarly, if there are other regulations to apply, they can't come in and say you cannot, cannot it, you cannot do anything that may endanger underground drinking water. And your regs can't allow injection that does this. Measure Z is coming in a totally different situation. It's saying here are circumstances where uses where you can't re-inject. So if you can't, there's no endangerment to underground drinking water. It's only when you want to come in and inject that you have to make sure you don't endanger it, whether that be under the federal scheme or the state scheme that evaluates what you can do that. And so that's where the state has to make sure that its regs will ensure that those people that want to dispose of waste won't endanger drinking water. The measure C is the at the other end. It's just simply saying there won't be, and clearly if there won't be, there won't be endangerment. That's why we're arguing it's consistent with the safety of the law. Well then, what about the language that says that regulations of the administrator under this section? Your state underground injection control programs may not prescribe requirements which interfere with or impede <coughs> underground injection. Because this goes to the second point I, I'm, the second theme, which is this, the statutes will talk about activity that's permitted or not, but that doesn't mean that because it's permitted, you have a, there's a mandate to allow it. Yes, but this goes a little further. It says you cannot prescribe requirements which interfere with the Oregon team. Doesn't that restrict the ability to go 
prohibit the ability to engage in underwater injection. Underground injection is even sure. Well, the statutory section that you're citing deals with what kind of regulations can a state set up to govern the permitting. And they, they can't, if, they're, if you're going as a state to set up a, a scheme of, to allow underground injection, then you, you can't do it in a way that is inconsistent with the Safe Drinking Water Act. But that doesn't mean that you have, once you do comply, that you then have a right. Stood the test of time. 
Um, it says that you can't allow drilling, lead drilling, or deepening below its present bottom. And then the, they can see that although this requirement deals with subsurface operation, it appears to be within the local authority to prohibit operations. And is a valid prohibition provided with useful application. That was at page 483. Now, let's look at page 490. And this allows uh, prohibitions on open impoundment of waste in open sums. And it, it requires that the waste be discharged into steel tanks. And again, this is found by the state. The state says this is not preemptive. All of these activities have an effect on downhole operations. So to say that there's no authority to do something that affects downhole operations is too simple. And to say that the land use authority does not address preemption misses the point because it's the land use authority, authority that the state concluded allowed these activities to come. Doesn't this ordinance go much further by prohibiting basically any above ground activity? Well, it's it, it first of all, any above ground activity in support of subsurface activity. Well, for for example, if it says no new wells, which it does, <clears throat> that's no different than what the agency opinion allows. And your honor, if it allows them to say that you can't deepen a well, or um, there's a case that, I'll, that they, if it also says that you can't, that you can regulate the depth of a sidetrack well, that is no, that is no more intrusive than saying you can't re-inject or. How would you reconcile that with the Attorney General? Uh, that, that one can prohibit drilling an existing well deep and it's clearly some surface. Right. And allow by the Attorney General. Uh, what's, what's the rationale? What's the distinction? Why does the Attorney General allow that? Or provide some purpose, not impermissible. Because, Your Honor, analytically, if you think about the ability to totally ban operations, mm -hmm. then all operations, then analytically, you should be able to prohibit certain operations. And so you can prohibit no new wells, which is what we do and which is what the AG says appropriate. And your honor, you can you can prohibit the injection of wastewater, which is which does have a subsurface impact, but no more so than saying uh, you can't do that well. And finally, we'll talk more specifically about the fracking or the well stimulation treatment. But that is a type of operation, and if you can if you can limit all operations, there should be no reason why you can't limit particular operations. Where we would step across the line then, if we said that you can only frack in this fashion, or you can only deepen your wells in this fashion, or um, if you're going to put in a new well, it must be um, handled A, B, and C. That's the difference. It's, it's the, the statutes, the cases 
say the, the city, the county cannot prohibit weather, where, excuse me, how an operation will occur, but they can determine whether it will occur. They allow them, but they don't require them. 
And what it, about what about public resources compensation for the sense of the policy you know, to extract oil and, oil and gas resources with minimum waste and encouraging the use of injection techniques to facilitate it. Public Resources Code 3400 seems to have a similar policy set forth. Although, were such state policies present in the cited cases that you have referred to, some counter, counter state policy that would encourage such a behavior? Cases I have cited uh, do not deal with the daughter statutes. But similarly, Your Honor, the cases don't say the other opposite. And, and the, the section that the plaintiffs talk about, 3106, speaks in terms of the wise use and the safe use of, of uh, oil and gas operations. And um, if, number one, that were true, that, that they have to, that daughter statutes mandate these operations, then why would the city, excuse me, why would the county be allowed to ban specific operations? That is the question, is, is the county allowed to ban specific operations in view of those statutory policies? That's right. And, and We've got the Attorney General's opinion on that. And then we do have the land use case, which plaintiffs can see did involve preemption. Specifically 
to what the DAGA regulations. Um, the night the Attorney General's opinion, albeit a while ago, walked through all of the DAGA regulations. And, and it it has stood the test of time and it did consider that. And then subsequent to that, there's the Higgins case, which Counsel for Chevron uh, noted and we cited in our brief. And that's a 1964 case. And it looked at all of the state regulations in play at the time, and that includes uh, the Dogger statutes. And it said um, that the Santa Monica ordinance banning oil and gas drilling on tidelands and submerged land was not preempted. So it went straight to preemption. And then Hermosa Beach, while not focusing directly on preemption, is a 2001 case where there was a ban of oil and gas operations by a local initiative and it was upheld. And then finally, uh, to repeat the point, uh, the ability to ban has really not been disputed. And even plaintiffs would agree. They, they describe it as delineating certain areas. But if you can ban, then we argue that you can weather, weather operations are not high. talk for a minute about um, the savings laws. We've been told uh, that the savings clause does not apply here and it precludes banning uh, well stimulation treatment. Secondly, 
if you look at the, I believe it's the Senate discussion. Now this is part of the analysis of the legislature. And it's saying essentially the same thing. And, and, and Your Honor, um, <coughs> the savings clause isn't frozen in time. It, it does not um, require that you be stopped at anything new is not subject to it. it, it what it's saying is that the, as the law evolves, that um, here, the, the uh, well stimulation treatment SB4 was not saying that the field is completely occupied by the state. It's not saying that the local agencies can't also have a role to play. regulations don't say this statute excuse me, does not say that these programs must be allowed. They're saying that they may not impede these operations unless there's a risk to the groundwater, say the drinking water. They're not saying that you must grant a permit as long as you comply with the regulations. They're saying the regulatory scheme set up by the state cannot in any way allow a permit to be issued that risks the safe drinking water. So if you issue a permit, you can't interfere or impede that kind of activity. But if you don't issue a permit, it's okay to allow you on it completely? No. I, I believe, Your Honor, what that's saying is the regulations that govern how a permit is issued must not contravene the federal scheme except with that exception. But that's the regulations that determine whether you get a permit or not. But that's not saying that if you get a permit consistent with the state regulations <coughs> that you then have an automatic right to do that. Limit to permit any applications. Just if any regulations of the administrator under this section for state underground injection control programs may not prescribe the requirements which you do with the if, if, as long as, right, because the goal here is to avoid endangering drinking water, and when you're completely prohibiting an operation, you're not endangering your Well, that's when we get down to the end. But the question really that I had was, who gets to make that call? Who is empowered to make the determination? So whether it is essential to assure that underground sources of drinking water will not be endangered by the injection, it appears <coughs> that the State Department of Gas and Geothermal Resources in consultation with the State Water Resources Control Board, has made such a determination, or at least exercised the power to make such a determination. <coughs> and again, whether that determination was 
accurate or not. They nonetheless exercise that power. And so, having done so, ordinarily we accord some deference to an agency's inter interpretation of its own power uh, and ability. So, having exercised that power to make such a determination, doesn't that indicate that the higher authority, namely the state, clothed with the power that has been given to it by the Environmental Protection Agency, has occupied that, that area, made that determination, and it cannot be overturned by a local uh, governmental finding to the contrary. I'm not explaining myself well, or maybe I am explaining myself and you, you disagree with me, but Your Honor, the, what this is, as I read it, what this is saying is that the state can't set up a program that prevents these things from occurring, except with the exception, except with the exception of some. But it's saying the state can't set up an underground injection program that does not allow A and B. Agree, but it doesn't follow from there that because the state's program that, that an applicant must comply with comes in and assume that the state program does not preclude A and B, and so it is legal, that therefore it follows from there that just because each year it gets a permit or could get a permit, that they are therefore entitled, <laughs> uh, their man the, the local agencies are mandated to allow that to occur. How does that play in against you know, what's been referred to as the savings clause in subsection D of Title 42 of the United States Code 300 H 2 part of this section up on the screen, that says that nothing in this subchapter shall diminish any authority of the state or political subdivision to enforce any law or regulation respecting underground injection. <coughs> but then goes on to say, but no such law or regulation shall relieve any person of any requirement otherwise applicable under this subject. Is, is that curtail the ability to, to help up no underground injection? This allows it, this stands for the proposition one that feels not fully articulated right? that you are always precluded you have that you cannot have a role if we regulate the manner in which the underground injection occurs that's that's what it is but if we say it shall not occur at all then the case is talking about the land use authority and supported by the state, the Attorney General, allow that to happen. Your Honor, to step back and give an example, if the interpretation plaintiffs are articulating is correct, then if the city, if, if, a, if a party were to receive an underground injection permit in the city of Los Angeles, that the city of Los Angeles could not say you're not allowed to do that. And that's where the land use cases show the other side of this interpretation. The city of Los Angeles cannot say uh, this is how you shall operate your condition. But they can say you can't do it at all. And that's really this tension that we've been talking about.
it says the drilling of new oil and gas wells is prohibited. And oil and gas wells means wells drilled for the purpose of exploring for, recovering, or aiding in the recovery of oil and gas. What wells aid in the recovery of oil and gas that are exploration or recovery wells? Does, in other words, does this, does this outlaw steam injection wells? The language is certainly broad enough that it would. Does it outlaw wastewater disposal wells? The language seems broad enough to do so. When we looked at that language, Your Honor is correct. But we've got the county council's impartial analysis. And if you look at all of the provisions I put forward on the purpose, when they talk about expanding operations, that's a very different proposition. Because um, as long as the operations don't expand, then it's permitted. And as Your Honor has asked me, some of these operations require new wells to be put in to continue. Well, you know, the county council's analysis is certainly it's helpful to have, but the county council didn't draft this regulation. And frankly, the elephant in the room is is that it's to the county's benefit to minimize the effect of this ordinance because of the tremendous financial exposure to the county's moderate if it stands and is enacted to its letter. So, you know, I appreciate that, but I can't accept it entirely without question. Well, and if the analysis stood alone without reference back to measures even, um, but if you look at Measure Z, it actually walks through um, the different operations and says we don't want them expanding. And it talks about the different purposes that the widgets is. And, and so if we're talking about not expanding something, and we're also acknowledging that certain operations require continually putting in new wells, there's a tension here that just can't but if, as the evidence tends to show, in order to continue existing operations, <coughs> additional wells, in addition to presently operating steam injection wells, additional steam injection wells need to be added, which would increase the net number of wells in operation. And then, in order for that process of steam injection to be productive, how, how, can, how can one reconcile drilling interpretation. If, if an operation would require A, new wells, and B, the number of wells then in operation were greater than was in existence prior to the effective date of measure C, then you're right, sure. Okay. Having said that, a great, a great deal of the operations may continue uh, because the net number of new wells is we are regardless.
only within this specific section of the county. For purposes of just looking at what the police power is, let's forget about preemption. I don't know, there's a city, it was in Hermosa Beach, I think, where they said you can outlaw entirely, you're dealing with the city and city limits. But here, you know, you have a city. A very, very large county, a very large portion of which is very sparsely populated and has been the subject of oil drilling efforts for decades and decades. Is there a distinction between prohibiting called the drilling activities within a certain portion of the county and outright blanket prohibited those activities <coughs> anywhere within the county. Well the cases certainly don't draw that distinction. The cases give the local agencies the authority it just so happens that the county is a bigger physical entity than a lot of the city has, has come up. But there is nothing within the, the law that we saw that drew that distinction. myself 
is it's not whether there will be an impact below ground, because the ban has an impact below ground, but rather are you dictating how an operation occurs versus whether it will occur? Is, would be, discussion on severance uh, and the question was whether first of all whether it's grammatically and functionally severable. Uh, if, if your honor looks at measure Z, LU 121, 122, 123, each of those pro provisions are set forth with their own definition and their own uh, requirements. They are pretty separate. And then those three are grafted into the four order plan, the coastal plan, and the general plan. If your honor were to strike one provision or another, it would be a very simple exercise to say that LU whatever is preempted and therefore uh, the other it, therefore it is struck from all of those three planning documents or four order. In pursuit of the determination of whether the injection and impoundment section and the no well drilling section are separable from each other. Isn't there an interplay between those two? At least depending upon one's interpretation of what no new wells drilled for the purpose of exploring for recovering or aiding in the recovery of oil and gas means. I don't think so, Your Honor, and, and tell me if I'm not answering your question, but let's assume that Your Honor were to say that uh, um, no new wells is struck. Uh, still, the other two requirements would remain about uh, surface impoundment or reinjection, and two, a well stimulation treatment. Let's flip that around the other way. Okay. Suppose the water injection and impoundment section was struck, was struck. <laughs> and you still had in effect the immediate prohibition on any new oil and well, oil and gas well drilling, including wells, <coughs> drilled for the purpose of aiding in the recovery from oil and gas. Well, and when we're to interpret that, we include steam injection wells and waste disposal wells. So does it, the second section fall with the first? I don't think so. So if Your Honor is saying, let me make sure I've got this right, that you were to strike the provision about the reinjection and surface impoundment, let's call it 
for assuming that to be the case. Assuming you were to strike that, then that would no longer be something that could be prohibited. Now, the no new wells, depending on how you interpret it, let's assume you say it's a <coughs> net new wells, would still be there. But, and so they could, you could use wells, and you could use wells to re-inject. It wouldn't be prohibited. Could you drill new wells for that purpose? Yes, because depending on how you define new wells, you have said, but we won't let you stop re-injection. So a new well could be for re-injection, or it could be under any circumstances, subject to the permits for dogger. So, so would the court have to interpret no new wells to mean no new wells except steam injection or with um, wastewater disposal wells? No, because you're simply expanding the universe of what's a permissible new well. You're saying that a new well uh, can include uh, the re-injection under a UIC program. The question you would wrestle with on the, the, net, the new wells is whether it means no wells at all of any type versus net wells. But the purpose for which it can be done would not, we would, it would not, it would no longer be possible to say you fall under the re-injection and therefore you can't do it. But as to whether it's a new well, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if that doesn't, isn't affected by it, by, by whether you allow certain uses. See, because the no new, new well means it, it, it's just how many wells you can have is it, it, as plaintiffs are arguing, that means absolutely no new wells for any purpose versus any net new wells for any purpose. And then the question is, okay, one of those purposes is not allowed. But it may be under that separate provision that you've struck is no longer. Doesn't that essentially involve rewriting the no new wells section? No, because if, let's see how it plays. So if you would strike, I'm, I'm going to get to the minute. Hypothetically, yeah, yeah, if this yes. were that, if the court found that the wastewater injection and impoundment inspection was preempted. Correct. And the no new wells section was taken to mean exactly what it said. No new wells drilled for the purpose of recovery or aiding in the recovery of oil and gas. was interpreted because of that sweeping language to include new steam injection <coughs> or new wastewater injection within its prohibition. How, how would one deal with that? Don't, don't they stand or fall together? Um, I don't think so. The, uh, the so in, in a world in which there is no, the provision on re-injection is, is gone. The no new wells is, is, not, uh, is not limited uh, in its present form um, to re-injection or no re-injection. It just says what it says. And so anything that the new well provision provides, it is allowed. And I don't see that as, if the no new wells provision said, you can't have new wells and, um, and, and, it, and it was saying that you can't have, um, that you can't have, re, it, it's a total number issue, not a, a use issue for the no new wells. If I understand what you're saying, you're saying, New, no new wells section could stand, however, could not be applied to steam injection or wastewater uh, injection or impoundment. Well, I'm not sure I 
So now let's let's take a simple, uh, really simple example. Let, let's say there were three wells in an area, and one of them was for for uh, free injection. Uh, if you said that we're striking the provision regarding free injection. The new well provision would still be the same. It would say three wells are allowed, and you can do three wells. And if you came in and said, I want to re-inject, they have to say, well, is it a new well or not? If it's not a new well, you can do it. Under, and it depends, of course, on how you interpret three. You know, is it expanded operation or not? Wouldn't that step on the toes of the preemption issue regarding injection and impoundment? You no, know, I think if, but for instance, wouldn't that impair or impede under the state of the other? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, interrupt you. No, trying, no. I'm just trying to explain yeah. you know, what, what it is that concerns the court. If the federal prohibition is you cannot impair or impede, then prohibit the addition of more wells to maintain the steam chest would seem to fall in that same category. Again, assuming that preemption is found to to a Well. It, uh, it's, it's a standard, the new, new well standard is being applied uh, neutrally. It's not calling out whether certain operation is appropriate or not. Um, and, and so, while the while the effect of it may involve um, um, certain operations, it's not it's not intended to preclude or allow operations other than by the total number. Um, so let me uh, talk about the second. Right, which is the volition of separability or separability. Um, it's clear that all three land use uh, provisions were part of uh, measures that it, it's stated as such in what was submitted up here, not all three. And, Your Honor, maybe most importantly, this is Measure Z, Section 9. And earlier it was argued that there's no evidence. And actually, this is Measure Z itself. And it specifically declares what Council was arguing was not going on in the voters. And that is, by passing it, they're declaring <coughs> that if any portion is invalid, the rest should still be implemented. That's true, but doesn't case law say that those savings clauses are not controlled? They're not determined if, in fact, the circumstances actual circumstances indicate that the will of the voters was that. One would say that there's not sufficient evidence to indicate that other another portion or portions would independently 
isn't that really the test? The listening is separate. Really. Well, I think Your Honor is, is uh, going back to your first set of questions on whether you can separate out the different. The savings clause is, is helpful, but it's not, I believe the case law indicates it's not controlled. The court still has to go through the test about whether it's grammatically, functionally, or volitionally separate. Right. And, and so this isn't being put up for the proposition that the first part of it, which is what you were asking about grammatical and, and uh, whether functionally you can separate it out. That's a test that has to be met. And then the second piece is um, you, know, you look to, you look first to the measure. And then you look to, um, you should look, we would argue, to the, to the administrative record. Uh, and uh, the, beyond that, uh, case law does not uh, welcome campaign literature and the other materials. I do need to take the a look at that case. Mr. Klein, you can give us that citation. The one that you cited for the proposition that the bumper sticker is going to be right there. Yeah. Things other than what's in the ballot measure. San Francisco Chronicle. Pardon? San Francisco Chronicle. I can bring you the case or I can even put up a slide for you, but yeah, we can give you that information. I'd like to get that citation before you leave today. Of course. I'll put it on the record and it shouldn't be ex parte, but I do want to get that before you go to No, no, yeah. So, Your Honor, let me, let me try it and, and close and wrap this all together. Um, there's a tension, but there's also not a bright line between subsurface and surface. You are correct that the Local land use authority focuses on surface, and other focuses on subsurface. But um, as we've gone through and seen, there are um, there's a good body of law that says primarily the AG's opinion, but cases since then, um, we've been full of five that have allowed specific operations that do have an impact on subsurface. And so it should be looked at in terms of uh, whether you're banning particular operation versus whether you are uh, just prescribing or requiring how that operation must be conducted. And so um, the simple one is no new wells. Uh, regardless of how your, your honor interprets it, uh, the courts allow that um, to be a, 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 it's been upheld. And, and secondly, um, it, it gets back to the purpose of all of this. If you can ban completely, then you can ban particular operations. Um, and, and then the second point is what the permit scheme mandates versus what it allows. And on that, Your Honor, we would argue that, in fact, the permit scheme, say, um, allows certain operations, but it doesn't require that those operations go forward. And that's inconsistent with the cases that we've cited. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Snow. Okay, Ms. Conn, you've been waiting patiently all day. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, actually, um, Savannah Fletcher is going to uh, address the preemption issues. Okay. And then following that, Peter Broderick is going to address the severability questions. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Savannah Fletcher, and as my co-counsel said, I am here on behalf of Protect Monterey County, and here speaking for the interveners in all six cases. Just get it out of the gate. Measure Z is not preempted. There is a long case history that is upholding the right of local counties and cities to prohibit and regulate oil and gas uses. 
In fact, the plaintiffs have no case law in the oil and gas field on their side. This is why they pull out cases outside of the oil and gas field to try and find preemption specific to those regulations. They pull on the Attorney General's opinion and misinterpret its scope. And further, they reference the state agencies and by... Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> and they, I decided, you know. <laughs> uh, and further, they reference the state environmental impact report as justification for what the law says. For the Attorney General's opinion, the environmental impact report, these do not change the law. And the law finds that Measure Z is not preempted. In fact, each prohibition which is within Measure Z has an express savings clause. But before we get to that, I'd like to get to the three elements of Measure Z, the three prohibitions we've been discussing all morning. We generally agree with the county, with some of our key differences being our interpretation of new wells, which aligns with the plaintiffs, in that, as you said before, the language is very clear. The prohibition against new wells means precisely that. All right, so you agree that it is your position that no new wells means no new wells, not no new net number of wells. Precisely. Okay. I will clarify slightly, though, that that means no new wells, no expansion of the current footprint. Things like sidetracking wells and modifying and cleaning current wells is not a new well. Where, where do you get that language for that slant on it? What, what in the ordinance says that? The ordinance itself says that you may modify current wells, which would include sidetracking. Further, Where does the ordinance itself say that you can modify existing wells? Yes, if my co counsel could pull up the exact language for me, that would be great. Um, I believe we have, I don't have a full copy of measures, but we can come back to it. Okay, happy to come back to that when we get to that prohibition. Really, the thing I'd like to address now is just a simple clarification on the prohibition against wastewater injection. You asked county how to distinguish between storage and disposal, and we agree that the wastewater injection prohibition is prohibiting wastewater injection for the intent of storage or disposal. And what that means and why there is both storage and disposal is because when applying for a well, it can be a specific disposal well, so you inject that wastewater permanently into the ground. You can also apply for a permit to dispose of that wastewater I mean, not sorry, not to, to store that wastewater underground. The intent is still to store it there for whatever length of time. It is not the same as injecting wastewater with the intent of further production, such as steam flood. Well, what is, what is steam flood, steam injection? Are you saying it's neither storage nor disposal? Precisely. And, and what's the basis for that? Well, that is a field that Dogger does know, and when one applies for a permit, they apply with the intent for a specific use of that well. And when you're applying for steam injection for further steam production through the steam flooding process, that is what that well is for. It is not one for wastewater disposal, wastewater injection. That is the distinction. So, you would leave it? The power would go back to the state agency to decide which it is? This is a power, yes, precisely. This Dogger already does have a permitting scheme. And within that permitting scheme, they clarify when one applies in the lengthy exhibits that plaintiffs have given you showing permits what the intent of that well is for. And this is not something Measure Z is trying to interfere with. Rather, Measure Z is simply prohibiting wastewater injection wells. How, how many, because it's my understanding, you're being the state position, that Measure Z allows the reverse osmosis treatment of water that is produced from wells. Is that correct? Yes. So, how does one do that without storing? One, again, the storage prohibition is against underground storage. For reverse osmosis, when you bring water to the surface, 
they will temporarily be held before going to the reverse osmosis treatment. Okay. And that is not storage as prime measure Z. How would you classify what is done with purified water that comes out of the reverse osmosis process? Well, that is outside the scope of a prohibition on wastewater injection because, precisely as you said, it's purified water. If you're addressing the brine that comes from this process, would you like me to discuss that as well? Sure. Okay. So the brine itself does not have to work, as plaintiffs claim, within this ecosystem where you must re-inject that brine. Rather, the brine can be trucked elsewhere. The brine can be further treated. There's new technology that allows one to process brine without injecting it into wastewater wells. So this is getting into... Is that in the record? It's not in this record because it's not actually applicable to the preemption question. That is more a question of as applied takings and the cost that plaintiffs might have if they are forced to use different technologies. But for the purposes of the preemption question, is simply interpreting how one defines wastewater injection. So what, if the brine is trucked elsewhere, you're saying? That, that the brine can be trucked elsewhere? Yes. Uh, and done what? Does, it, does the ordinance purport to regulate what's done with it once it's taken elsewhere? No. Measure Z simply prohibits uses of land within its county. It is not getting into the technical processes through which any company deals with its brine. It is simply prohibiting the use of wastewater injection wells within the county as a means of disposing of that brine. And so it is for this reason that we have both storage and disposal within the definition of wastewater disposal. But that's simply to get at the two different time frames. Does anybody decide whether the use of above-ground equipment, such as a truck, whether temporary or permanent, mobile or fixed, in support of oil and gas, wastewater and bomb? Does somebody decide, have to decide, where that brine is being trucked to and what's going to be done with it. The, the companies presumably have to choose where to take their brine. That is not what Measure Z is seeking to prohibit or regulate. It's simply prohibiting the injection of that brine into wastewater injection wells within Monterey County. Well, it doesn't. It says the use of any facility, permits, or above ground equipment, whether temporary or permanent, mobile or fixed, in support of waste, whether injection of oil or gas waste in the compound is prohibited on all lands. It says the use of the equipment is prohibited on the lands without regard to where it's going or what's going to be done with the, this byproduct that you're suggesting can be taken elsewhere. Yes, I see your point. The truck there, though, is not being used to further the wastewater injection into wells within Monterey County. In that hypothetical, the truck is being used to transport that brine outside the county to a different jurisdiction, and Monterey County and Measure Z does not seek to prohibit what that truck would do elsewhere with that brine. So then does it become a matter of wider statewide concern? No, it does not, because it's not forcing that to go outside of the county. There are still solutions for that within the county that would simply not be injecting it back into underground aquifers. Well, if it's not being struck or placed somewhere in Monterey County and it's going somewhere else, then it's obviously outside Monterey County. So does that, does that not, in essence, make it a matter of statewide concern? As I said before, there are other technologies that address how one can treat brine without having to either inject it into wastewater injection wells nor truck it off site. But that is not the scope of the preemption inquiry. That is rather an as applied takings if there's more expensive technology available to deal with that brine. And thus we do not need to get into the technical advances that these companies may make. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't state statutory scheme and the regulations that have been 
promulgated by the Department of Gas and Geothermal Resources. establish a statewide program for dealing with the disposition of these this water and the byproducts of, uh, of oil recovery. I would like to speak exactly to what the Safe Drinking Water Act does attempt to do through its underground injection control programs. Is that what you're referring to? Oh, go ahead. Yes, may I go into that? Okay. So First, we must focus on what the overall purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act is before getting into a specific subdivision addressing the underground injection control program. And as we've heard here, the Tenth Circuit found that the purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the clear overriding concern of Congress, was that of assuring the safety of present and potential sources of drinking water. So that is the overall goal throughout the entire Safe Drinking Water Act, is protect drinking water to protect underground aquifers. The goal is not to protect and promote underground injection of wastewater. Further, this is the goal of the Safe Drinking Water Act, but there's also, yes? No, you sure? Okay. Um, I first want to say, as we're addressing this, is getting at the issue of federal preemption solely, and this is the only statute raised against wastewater injection, and so we are just looking, focusing on the Safe Drinking Water Act and its applicability to wastewater injection. So the purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act is to protect drinking water. Additionally, there is an express non-preemption clause which applies to the entire Safe Drinking Water Act. As you can see here in section 300H2D, it says nothing in this subchapter, and as we've highlighted on that table of contents, the subchapter is in fact referencing the entire Safe Drinking Water Act. It states, nothing in this subchapter shall diminish any authority of a state or political subdivision to adopt or enforce any law or regulation respecting underground injection. And that is precisely what Measure Z does. It adopts a prohibition against wastewater injection. Isn't, isn't it a requirement of that same section that regulations of the administrator under this section for state underground injection control programs may not prescribe requirements which interfere, or, interfere with or impede the underground injection? It is important to notice where that subprovision is located within the act. The plaintiffs pluck this one subprovision out of the act to say that it somehow overrides the non-preemption clause, but it does not. This subprovision is subordinate to the non-preemption clause, which applies to the entire act. This subprovision resides in the section called Regulation for State Programs, and it directs the EPA to set minimum requirements for the federally approved underground injection control programs. Well, what, what about subsection B within that section. It says regulations under subsection A of this section for state underground injection programs shall contain minimum requirements to, for effective programs to prevent underground injection which endangers safe drinking water sources. Such regulations shall require that a state program in order to be approved subparagraph B shall require, in the case of a program that provides for authorization of underground injection by permit, that the applicant must satisfy the state that the underground injection will not endanger drinking water sources, and two, in the case of a program which provides for such an authorization by rule, that no rule may be promulgated which authorizes any underground injection which endangers drinking water sources. Is, is it? Hasn't Congress indicated the intention to occupy that area? No. What Congress has indicated here, specifically, specifically to the state underground injection control programs, which are approved by the EPA, or if the state chooses not to take up that program, which are run by the EPA, it guides those programs 
and setting their minimum floors. And mm -hmm. simply says that within that state underground injection control program, they must consider whether or not the injection of brine or other fluids would be essential in the prohibition of it, would be essential to ensure that underground drinking water is safe. This is because when Congress wrote the Safe Drinking Water Act, it was seeking to set standards across the entire country for every single state. They were setting minimum floors, and that is why they limited programs through the Safe Drinking Water Act to just that minimum floor. Unless, they didn't want to set a higher floor, but as I read in the non-preemption clause, they explicitly reserved that right for localities and other state programs to build upon that floor. This is simply Congress's goal to cabin how much they will require as a minimum floor. That is why it is in a smaller subdivision specifically applied to state underground injection control programs. And because of that reason, we see cases like Bath Petroleum versus Sobus. It's 309 F sub 2D 357. It's a 2004 case in which the state of New York did not choose to take primacy over the Safe Drinking Water Act Underground Injection Control Program. Instead, the federal government continued to enforce that program. However, due to the non-preemption clause we see in the Safe Drinking Water Act, New York chose to further regulate underground injection and require additional monitoring and other regulatory requirements. The courts found this was not preempted because there is an explicit savings clause that allows states and localities to build upon these minimum floors through the Safe Drinking Water Act. And really, plaintiffs just take this to a ridiculous extreme. By having these minimum floors act rather as a maximum ceiling that states and localities cannot build upon, when expressly throughout the Safe Drinking Water Act, it reiterates that its purpose is to set minimum floors. In section 300HB1, it states, State underground injection programs shall contain minimum requirements for effective programs to prevent underground injection, which endangers drinking water sources. This is an emphasis on setting the minimums, and it expressly preserves the rights to build upon those minimums at either the state or local level. But by the same token, doesn't subsection 2 say the regulations under this section state underground injection control programs may not prescribe requirements which in their view are indeed the underground injection. Yes, it does say that is a limitation on how far the federal government was willing to reach in forcing states and localities to prescribe to a certain type of standard. Well but it does say that suggest a congressional intention not to indeed or interfere with the underground injection of brine or other fluids. It suggests an intent from Congress that they did not want to force all states to meet that standard. But we must again look to the express non-preemption clause that applies not only to that subsection, but to the entire subchapter, the Safe Drinking Water Act, that still reserves rights for states and localities to go farther that is simply cabined to the limitations on a federally mandated underground injection control program. It does not limit the ability of localities, such as Monterey County, to prohibit wastewater injection. And if we were to read that to its extreme, it would say that, as the county's council explained, that this zoning law, if it were to, or if it were to read to preempt any other zoning, that, again, if an underground injection control program were to approve and permit a wastewater injection well within any city boundaries, within a residential area, that that locality would have no recourse or ability to prohibit such an action. It can't be read to be that far. Instead, localities retain the right to further protect their underground sources of drinking water, just as the entire purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Act requires. And in the interest of time, I would love to discuss the... If you, if you need to continue tomorrow, I will allow you to continue. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, I'll just read the So, as we see in the Safe Drinking Water Act, 
there is this express non preemption clause which preserves the rights of localities like Monterey County to prohibit wastewater injection. And due to that express preemption clause, we need go no further. One does not need to look for implied preemption when it's expressly stated that that right is reserved. And since plaintiffs only raised the Safe Drinking Water Act and implementation through Dogger as the thing that would preempt wastewater injection, that is the end of the inquiry for wastewater injection. It is not preempted and rather allowed. Well, under federal law. Mm -hmm. But you still have to address state policy and pursuance. Okay. You have to, the Department of Gas and Geothermal Resources has authority by virtue of the primacy that was granted by the EPA. Mm -hmm. It also has independently authority, which must be examined under the California Public Resources Code, independently of the same drinking water. Within the California Public Resources Code, the only sections that get directly to underground injection control wells are those sections implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act. I believe it's section 3000 to 3003. If you look to other policies within the California Public Resources Code, those are not strong enough to preempt any prohibition against wastewater injection. What are you talking about? Of the resources code, section 3106. Happy to. So, section 3106 states the policy of the state at the start of their oil and gas regulations encouraging its production. But we have a long line of cases that have found that is not strong enough to imply a preemptive intent. In fact, if you look back to Beverly Oil, which gets um, to a similar uh, section in the Public Resources Code, which plaintiffs have also pointed to, section 3400, which explicitly says, let me find the quote, in the, oil, in the people have a primary and supreme interest in oil deposits. That's Public Resources Code, section 3400. And it is recognized that oil production is a business which must operate, if at all, where the resources are found. Nevertheless, city zoning ordinances prohibiting the production of oil in designated areas have been held valid. And again, that's in Beverly Oil at page 558. And is that the same as an outright ban? Uh, well, in Beverly Oil, we actually have the same prohibitions as you see prohibiting new wells and prohibiting well simulation treatment. And if you look at our slide, we actually compare the two cases. In Beverly Oil, they prohibited new wells, and they also prohibited the deepening of wells for increased production, which is explicitly a subsurface activity. And the court upheld that this was a valid prohibition at the city level. Similarly, Measure Z prohibits new wells, and it prohibits well stimulation treatments for increased production. And similarly, it is not preempted by these codes that say it is a policy of the state. Instead, we can look to other cases which do show the language for express preemption at the state level. Let's talk about 3106. Okay. 3106 says it is a policy and it is encouraged. But this is not strong enough to find that it preempts a prohibition of oil production. In fact, that policy was in place when Hermosa Beach was passed in 2001 which upheld the prohibition of all oil production activities within the entire area of Formosa Beach. And this was not preempted by any policy goals that you see in 3106. Did Formosa Beach address 3106? It does not, I believe, directly address it, but the fact that it was not found to preempt, this silence really speaks to the fact that there is this retained local police power to continue to enforce prohibitions. Well, you know, as uh, Mr. Tanaka has mentioned, and the council has mentioned, you have a tension between what, what is the general police power of the local governmental entity and independently of that, is there a preemption by a higher authority? So, first, you, you, you look at whether or not the power exists 
otherwise exist in a local entity. Then the next inquiry is, however, if it's prohibited, expressly or implied by law and by higher authority, then we have to go to that next step to see whether it's permitted to be like that. Precisely. And we can look to examples where the legislature has expressly preempted localities from regulating in specific fields. And that is notably absent in the language of Section 3106. If you look to Big Creek Lumber, it provides a great contrast between timber regulations within the California Public Resources Code and regulations related to oil and gas within the California Public Resources Code. As you can see, there is express non-preemption in Section 3690 for the California Public Resources Code that gets at oil and gas regulations. And it says, this chapter shall not be deemed a preemption by the state of any existing right of cities and counties to enact and enforce laws and regulations regulating the conduct and location of oil production activities. They have a broad scope of what this includes, but it's not limited to zoning, fire prevention, public safety, nuisance, appearance, <laughs> noise, fencing, hours of operation, abandonment, and inspection. This broad protection of the ability of counties to both regulate the conduct and location of these activities is in stark contrast to the language that the court found in Big Creek Lumber to preempt the regulation of conduct of timber operations. In that provision of the California Public Resources Code, section 4515.5D, it says, except as provided in subdivision E, individual counties shall not otherwise regulate the conduct of timber operations as defined in this chapter or require the issuance of any permit or license for those operations. Plaintiffs, in fact, pluck the language from this part of the resources code and try to apply its limitations to oil and gas, when clearly this is cabined to preempting conduct of timber operations. Further, when the court dealt with this language, it was hesitant to read that any further than a narrow limitation upon regulating the conduct of timber operations. But in that case, the court still found that they were at the county level allowed to regulate the location of timber operations. It's for this reason, it's further proof of the presumption against preemption, which applies with California law when considering whether or not a locality is preempted from prohibiting or regulating a field within the state of California. And that language is notably absent in section 3106. Stating a general policy is not the same as explicitly saying, as the legislature clearly knows how to do, that it is taking that field. Even if they're not the same, does, does it not indicate a strong policy of the state of California? It expressly states that. It does expressly state a strong policy, yet case law going all the way back to Beverly Oil in 1953 found that a strong policy was not enough to prove preemptive intent. And we must assume that the legislature knows case history when writing this legislation. And they knew that case going all the way back to 1953 found that language saying it's a strong policy was not enough to preempt. And yet they still only wrote language saying it is a strong policy. That shows no implication of preemption, but rather the opposite, and that they would still allow localities to further build upon it. In fact, that is also what the Attorney General's opinion says, which has been misconstrued by plaintiffs. And I would love to go on and explain that, but this would also be a perfect case to pause. We'll resume tomorrow at 1.30. We're going to have a calendar that's fairly so just really quickly, the case is Senate versus Jones. The citation is up there, 21 Cal 4th. It's the case that struck down the Let the Voters Decide Act of 2000 on a single subject ground. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is footnote 5 of Jones. And the issue in Jones was whether the, the, 
initiative at issue can properly join a politically popular um, subject, which there had to do with uh, how much you pay legislators, a lot like the fracking ban here, with, with other language. And the Supreme Court said the, append the petition appends a newspaper article containing the following passage, which includes a quotation attributed to the proponent of the initiative. When you go to the wall, I sit there for two hours a day and ask people if they want to sign a petition to cut legislative salaries. They say, where do I sign, said Costa. Costa was like the PMC here. You say you've got a petition to set up a special master to redistrict, redistrict, not even reapportionment. They say, what's that? And so the California Supreme Court is citing that as a piece of evidence that voters were not only confused but misled, and to figure out what was the driving force in enacting this piece of legislation in the same way you could in a severability analysis. If you go to the next slide quickly, please. Can I start? Is this in your takings presentation? This is in my single subject matter presentation that's happening a couple days from now. And, you know, so, can I clarify the FTP you asked for the site? Yeah. The site? We're going to argue this all tomorrow or when we get to single subject. Can I just do it? I'm just trying to give context. Well, but, but you, you asked, the court asked for the site. Correct. And here's the site in the text. I've, I've got one. So there's one other site I, I referenced this morning, which was the Brosnahan case. If you go back to the place. That's literally the political cartoon on the right there that appears in, in the Cal, Cal's third reporter at page 281. That's the Chief Justice Burke's dissent. And the majority of whom being cited by the county of the first say, well, the newspaper, radio, television, editorials, extends the public debate involving candidates, letters to the editor, letters to the editor, et cetera, and thinking about how to interpret the measure and the motivation or volition of the voters in the vote. I'm sorry, Your Honor, did you have one more Oh, I thought you were in the middle of saying something else to me before. No, no, you said it was Take a look at those cases. There's obviously a difference to references being made to certain documents and having a discussion about whether those are admissible or objections. I'll take it. Okay. Well, I'll take it. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank